Hello, everyone, and thanks again for joining us today. This webinar is entitled Building a Team, Assessing Your School's Wellness Environment and Developing an Action Plan, and it's brought to you today by Action for Healthy Kids. We have two presenters for today's session. My name is Heidi Knobloch, and I'm the Action for Healthy Kids Illinois Field Manager, so I work with all of our funded schools throughout the state of Illinois. And I have with me Hannah Ramsland, Action for Healthy Kids' as Indiana State Coordinator, who has also joined to share some information with us today. So before we get started, let's take a minute just to review some of the logistics. So once you're linked in, you'll see a control panel on your right-hand side. You can either use your telephone or speakers to listen to the presentation, but everyone is going to be muted to avoid static and background interference. You'll see at the bottom there is a dialog box on your control panel. So this is where you can type in questions into this box as we're going along, and we'll do our best to get them answered later on in the presentation. Uh, we will stop after each section to take some time for questions, so continue to, to populate that with questions as you have them. And if for some reason we're not able to address questions during the presentation, we will certainly address those via email following the webinar. Just so you know, the webinar is also being recorded, so links to the recording and to the handouts will be sent to you within two to three business days after the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we jump into the content of today's webinar, I wanted to first give you just a little bit of background about Action for Healthy Kids. So Action for Healthy Kids fights childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. Our network is made up of moms, of dads, teachers, students, school, community leaders, and school wellness experts who have banded together to create healthier learning environments for our children. And ultimately, we believe that everyone has a part to play in ending the nation's childhood obesity epidemic. And our tools, programs, and resources are some things that help make that possible. We were founded in 2002 by former Surgeon General David Satcher. And today, we have more than 80,000 members. We also partner with dozens of professional associations, government agencies, and corporations at the national and at the local level. And as you can see here on your screen, our ultimate goal is to create school communities where children know how to make those healthy choices from the minute that they walk in the door to the minute they leave at the end of the school day. So that encompasses everything from what happens during physical education, what happens in the cafeteria, but also things that happen in the classroom or the main office or in the hallways. So this presentation today is part of the Action for Healthy Kids Parent Leadership Series. Action for Healthy Kids believes that parents play a crucial role in creating healthy school communities, as well as local community volunteers. And what we've found is that school communities that include strong parent and volunteer advocates are generally more effective at creating changes that are sustainable and that are permanent. So we've developed this series to provide parents, volunteers, and school wellness advocates with the tools and the knowledge needed to make your efforts a success. So as you can see on your screen, these are some of the topics that are covered in this series. They've been divided into six separate webinars that we are going to be presenting live throughout the year, and we'll always have the latest ones archived for you to view later. Today's presentation, of course, is focused on building a wellness team in your school community, assessing your school's wellness environment, as well as developing and implementing an action plan. So we have a jam-packed session today, uh, but again, feel free to ask questions as we go along. So today's webinar will cover, cover several items. First, we'll talk a little bit about building a wellness team at your school, why you should build one, how you should build one, as well as tips for success. I should also note that some of this information is going to be relevant uh, for you if you do not have a wellness team at your school, but I also think the information is relevant for, for wherever you are in your building of your wellness team, whether you've had one for three years or five years, it's always good to kind of keep touch with what the best practices are so you can continue to motivate and energize your team. Second, after you gather your team, your first step will be to assess your school's wellness environment. So this will help you determine what your team will work on. So today we'll talk a little bit about the types of assessments that are available and how you can get started. And then finally, your team will need to develop a plan. So today we'll go over the basics of developing and implementing an action plan for a school wellness project or initiative. So at this time, I'm going to shift it over to Hannah, who will walk us through the first step of building a wellness team at your school. Hannah? Thank you, Heidi, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. We're going to start by talking about um, what a wellness team is. So in very general terms, wellness teams exist to make schools healthier. 
Uh, their, more, their work may include all or any of the things listed on the slide, such as identifying concerns, developing vision and goals, uh, leading various wellness projects or programs. Some exist to raise funds for those projects. Um, some wellness teams do measure project impacts and celebrate those successes. Wellness teams can exist at the district level, where teams work on the larger scale projects that have an impact across many schools, or some just at the school level, where teams work on projects that have an impact just, of course, at that particular school. Parents, teachers, administrators, school staff, students, board members, and even community members can be a part of a wellness team. And today, we're going to focus mostly on those at the school level uh, wellness team. So a wellness team can go by various names. Um, those are going to pop up on the next slide. But it can be formed as a subcommittee of your PTA um, or your school accountability committee, or it could be a standalone group. It can be formed as part of a comprehensive health and wellness initiative, like the Coordinated School Health, which is a systematic approach recommended by the CDC that addresses eight different components, components of your school wellness committee or wellness program. It can be also formed as a wellness program or framework like Game On, the Ultimate Wellness Challenge, which is one of our signature programs at Action for Healthy Kids. Game On is designed to be a creative, fun, and appealing to students. Uh, it involves both nutrition and physical activity challenges that can be tailored to your own individual school resources and commitment levels. Using programs like these can sometimes make it easier to get more buy-in from the school and other parents. Also, I wanted to mention something that's on the slide, the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. It is a recognition program offered by the USDA's Team Nutrition. And it focuses on um, different initiatives related to uh, nutrition and physical activity. And those schools that apply are given a bronze, silver, or gold achievement award, and sometimes monetary incentives um, once they re reach those different levels. So a wellness team can also be an unofficial group without a specific name that does health and wellness oriented projects. And sometimes there may be opposition of the idea of a formal wellness team. So you'll find that even a couple of champions um, that are dedicated can work together and actually accomplish quite a bit. There are a lot of benefits of working as a team as opposed to trying to do everything yourself. Um, these obviously include having just a greater skill set of folks around you. And those people can bring, obviously, a variety of skills, interests, and ideas to the table that may be able to uh, be more creative and take your ideas farther. Um, further or greater credibility, so people will take your work a little bit more seriously if they know that there's a group of people behind it. Obviously, having a team to help spread the workload will create that momentum and keep uh, your programs or projects going. And when multiple people are involved, these programs or policies or practices are more likely to be sustainable over the long term. And the knowledge that you're in it together creates the inspiration, motivation, and personal connections, which can all make a great difference in your school programming. So let's talk about how we get started and the action steps around those. First, um, we need to find out if any wellness-oriented groups already exist. So if they do exist, you need to find out what they're working on and get to know the people that are on the team. And if their, their work and their projects are headed in the same direction that you would like to go um, and have a similar focus, then go ahead and maybe try to get in with the team or invite yourself or uh, try to get someone to invite you to be a part of it. I'm sure they won't uh, turn down someone who's willing to be involved. And if there isn't an existing wellness group or team around, um, or maybe you know it has a different focus than what you're trying to focus on at the school, then you can kind of start or form your own little group to to um, to kind of move forth with your efforts. But you just want to make sure that if you do start your own group, that you communicate uh, very clearly with that other wellness group, and so you're not duplicating efforts because we know that that's. Um, definitely not going to be an efficient method in your school, and nor will it help get anything accomplished there. Next, you want to identify other champions to help you lead the committee. So these are people um, that will help kind of build this energy and passion and expertise um, as many of your other active contributors. So you should look for people that are creative, um, that are committed to, to the same uh, initiatives that you are, that have a, a passion about student health, 
Um, they should be people who are great communicators and overall are determined to see and help you through maybe challenges that may arise as you're trying to put these new initiatives in place. And finally, it's a great idea to develop an elevator pitch. So an elevator pitch is just the ability to describe why you want to create a wellness team. And it should take about 30 seconds or less. And that's what we call an elevator speech or an elevator pitch. And then in two minutes or less, you should also be able to describe what types of activities your team will do and what kind of time commitment will be necessary. So you want your people to know what they are committing to. Parents and school staff, we know that they're busy, right? So they only have just a few minutes um, to think and to answer back about you know, becoming part of that committee. And so if you make it succinct and very easy to understand, they'll be more likely to join your efforts if they understand that there's uh, a similar purpose at hand. So at this point, um, once you have a team um, and a group put together and you have your elevator speech, you know what you're wanting to do, it's really, really important that you get the principal's buy-in and or, at the, or even higher, whatever buy-in is appropriate at your school or district level um, for that commitment. From the research that out, that's out there, we know from our experience that without principal or administrative buy-in, um, support and long-term sustained changes will not occur at your school. So really, really uh, a key step in, in taking action and forming your wellness team. And at a minimum, they at least need to give their approval for what you're doing. So um, they may not quite be on board with uh, the whole wellness team initiative, but maybe there's a specific project that you want to start with, and maybe they can at least get the sign off and the approval to move forward with that. So. Um, we really believe that it's going to make a difference in the importance in your work, and if, especially if they're publicly willing to support it, that's even better. Uh, the most ideal situation is that your principal will actually become an active participant on your wellness team. Uh, we do realize, though, that principals and their ability to participate definitely depend on their commitments and workloads, so um, just keep that in mind as you're, you're building and putting together your, your wellness team, that basically you'll take whatever you can get um, with, with the principal or administrative buy-in. So this is a resource that is a very valuable one. Um, if you need help in talking to your principal or administrator um, in order to kind of create that sense of urgency, um, it's called the Learning Connection. And Action for Healthy Kids put this out um, just about a year ago. And it's a great connection between physical activity healthy eating and learning. And basically it says that kids who eat good food and are active are better learners. And it's just a great resource and it's put together very nicely um, in case you know your principals or administrators need some of that data or survey around um, why it's important to make wellness initiatives and, and have a wellness team at your school. Um, this report includes materials that can be shared with the principal and other uh, key school decision makers to increase their buy-in and support for school, school wellness. So this information is, of course, free and can be found on our website with a link above. And um, just to put it out there, uh, all of these links that you're going to see today will be sent to you in a few days following this presentation. So uh, once you have your principal or administrative support, the next step then is to invite uh, school staff, parents, or community members to actually join the wellness team. So you obviously may have people that the principal wants to appoint to this committee. So you need to make sure you touch base with him or her to find out who those people are and make sure you get them invited. Um, approach any staff who you might have a good relationship with and ask for any of their suggestions. Uh, you might want to start with your child's teacher. Um, to see if they know of other teachers or parents that have expressed an interest in school wellness. Because a lot of times, you know, parents are approaching the teachers, but the teachers don't really know where to send them. So um, sometimes parents aren't the ones to communicate that, but the teachers will be able to know how to, how to plug people in uh, who are interested. And approach anyone who seems like the obvious good fit, such as a school nurse, a health teacher, a PE teacher, school lunch personnel. Um, it never hurts to ask these folks. Most likely, they're the ones who are talking and making decisions about, um, you know, the, the nutrition and the, the physical activity in your school. So definitely those people um, 
could be an interested party and or a great resource to have around. Next, when we talk about the parent and community um, group, we want to survey those people uh, to find out how they perceive wellness at your school. So a survey, if you uh, initiate a survey, it can start to educate them and garner the interest in participating. So one easy way to do this is to send out a survey via email. Um, SurveyMonkey is a free online survey tool that you can use to ask about 10 questions for free. And ask what they feel is important, and don't forget to ask if they're interested in becoming part of your wellness team. You could also speak at um, the school staff meeting and or the PTO or PTA or accountability uh, committee meetings to try to draw up interest from those staff and or parents. Also, you could ask to be connected with the person who does the communications at your school. So it might be the principal, it might be a secretary member or someone from the PTO, and you could put out an email blast. Um, you could even announce it on the school Facebook page or in a newsletter or even send a flyer home with students. Uh, but all these ways are just uh, you know avenues to get the message out that a wellness team is forming and you want interested parties. Do keep in mind that some people may be shy about getting involved at first due to cultural differences or other reasons. So give these people personal invitations to get involved and ask them if they will invite others. Um, because if um, they're going to be shy about it, hopefully getting them involved will initiate others to be involved as well. And people definitely like it to be invited to do something. So now that you have um, you're starting to recruit the team. I mentioned it in the last uh, slide, but you want to make sure that you have a, a team that is uh, diverse and has a lot of community members um, and, and people that represent your school community involved. So this will help ensure that projects are meeting the actual needs of this school community instead of maybe what you might perceive it might be. So if you live in, live in a bilingual or multilingual com uh, community, provide translation if you need it. Um, but definitely having those people involved will create a deep understanding of uh, different cultures and norms and dynamics uh, that you may not be aware of. And this will also be in, to ensure that your projects that your wellness team is wanting to roll out will be sensitive and rele relevant and also just welcoming to all students and staff. Um, include the key players and influences, influencers excuse me, at the school. And also include people who can't commit the time because they may have some great ideas. Um, so it's good to always keep them involved, even if they can't maybe commit to being at all the meetings. And realize that not everyone on the team needs to be a champion, uh, that you need those people and those supporters are just as important. And they may not feel the same way, maybe passionately, that you do, but on a particular project, they may really bring some skills and contribute in other ways um, that you'll really see that your wellness team become more um, successful. So part of your uh, recruitment on your team might include students. And I know that sounds a little um, interesting, but we're going to kind of talk through that a little bit. Um, because students really have some great ideas. Um, but if you are going to include students on your wellness team, you know, it may not be necessary that they attend each of your uh, committee meetings. Or maybe they're able to submit ideas without making a, a meeting, per se. But if you do, be very clear about their roles and expectations. Um, so that they understand and their parents understand what they're signing up for. So consider creating um, on your wellness team just more than one student position. So it makes it less intimidating if the students know that they might be among their peers and they might be more willing to speak up like during meetings and have ideas and present them and not be so shy. You want to prep the kids before the meetings on the agenda and maybe how you plan to run meeting, meetings in, in your procedures. Uh, they probably won't have the experience in this area, so they might feel more comfortable if they'll know it, if you know what to expect if they do. And also, one thing to note here is to have um, more than one adult volunteer present if you're meeting in person with kids. That's just a good standard to follow for youth protection whenever you're working with them. Also, also prioritize students in your action plan. So don't just involve them for you know, publicity's sake, make sure that they're actually doing something and that they understand uh, the importance of their task. So you've recruited everybody for your wellness uh, team. And we're moving on and we're going to pretend that we're holding our first meeting. And what we want to do during this first meeting is to write a vision statement to help 
you and your wellness team define what your purpose is. So you start in, by having everyone in the group discuss a list of projects or areas that they'd like to address. Um, you may want to go through an activity where everyone writes down ideas and the whys behind them. Um, encourage this group to frame their ideas in a positive light in terms of solutions instead of problems. At this point, you don't want to get caught up in the how. This is simply just a time to brainstorm openly, brainstorm, excuse me, openly in order to, to discover the group's activities or the group's priorities. So um, you also, as everyone presents these ideas and the whys behind them, you want to look for common themes. And then those themes should drive your vision statement. So you can always come to the meeting prepared with sample statements and your own ideas on how the vision might read. And then as a group, you can kind of put it together and refine it. Refine it. So your statement should be clear and clearly defined of what your school will look like if you achieved all your wellness goals. So an example of a short, concise vision statement is shown. So the sample is uh, ABC Elementary students will learn how to make healthy choices from the minute they walk in the front door to the minute they leave at the end of the school day. School ABC will be recognized as the healthiest school in the state. Very clear, the statement can be used to create your goals and market your projects to your school, school community. So it's a great example of uh, what something simple might look like coming out of a wellness team out of the first committee meeting. So you could always take that as a sample and use it moving forward. Also at your first meeting, you want to charge the group with the task of promoting the vision and the work of the wellness team throughout the school community. So you've got everyone together, you want to define this vision, and then you want to kind of help disseminate that out to that school community. So it's important because uh, your team's work will create this sense of urgency by educating your school community about the state of children's health and that linking that information back to your daily practices um, that take place at the school. So they'll always need to make that connection between nutrition, physical activity, and student performance, like I outlined in the previous slide with the learning connection. So you want to make sure you give them tips on how to talk about the team's efforts. Um, you can share this webinar um, with them, which is a great resource. Um, this webinar will be recorded and archived um, on the Action for Healthy Kids website in case um, they want to view it later. And this would also be a good webinar even to uh, view during one of your first uh, wellness team meetings. So parents, teachers, students, school leaders, and community members can make lasting impact when we combine efforts. The key to providing children with consistent messages around health, nutrition, and physical activity is working together. So as I mentioned before, we do have a slideshow presentation that you can download and share with uh, your school wellness team and your, your school community. And it uses a lot of the same slides as this webinar, but you use it to kind of challenge your school um, and community. And it's called um, Share Healthy Food and Activity at School. And you can see the link there in the slide. But as I mentioned earlier, it will be shared with you um, after the webinar is over. So some tips for planning a successful meeting as you move forward with your wellness uh, team. You want to plan meetings that are obviously convenient for most people who are on your committee. Um, if possible, if there's an option to offer daycare or childcare, that would be helpful. Um, healthy snacks or meals. And try to have your meetings at regular times. For instance, the third Thursday, the second Tuesday at lunch, etc. Uh, make sure that you're creating a welcoming environment at every meeting. Uh, little things like greeting a person, smiling at them, looking at them in the eye really go a long way. So provide name tags in case others forget um, you know, the, the people's names and they can address them during the meeting. You want to offer opportunities for conversation and interaction. It definitely doesn't want to be a one-sided um, you know, conversation. And people will definitely feel more invested if they start to develop these relationships with other people on the committee. You always want to have a focused agenda. And if possible, you want to send it out in advance and really stick to it since it is time sensitive. And, and we know that, that you guys are uh, overcommitted as it is. So we want to make it short um, and succinct as possible. Definitely want to have an end time so that everyone uh, can get out and back to their normal activities. And they definitely don't want to feel like it's a waste of time. Um, so having a set agenda uh, 
will ensure that it'll keep people attending the meeting. Accomplish as much as you can before and after the meetings through emails and phone calls. Um, but sometimes just note that email is not the best way to communicate, so do obviously what is best for your school community. And if need be, if there's a big project that you're working on or various projects, if you need to form subcommittees, you might want to think about those routes too so that um, you're not necessarily spending the whole time of the full committee talking about a lot of the details on projects that are upcoming, that you keep the committee as, as uh, efficient as possible. So just wanted to share a success story with you. This is kind of demonstrates the value of a team. This is um, talking about uh, elementary school here in Indiana, in Gaston, Indiana. It's called West El Elementary School. And they had um, student fitness and nutrition were a concern for them at this school. Um, teachers, administrators had great intentions. Um, there was a school policy and school wellness policy in place and a school health council had been established. The teachers were offering health and wellness programming to their students. But the problem was there wasn't a lot of coordination of the information or other people's efforts. So um, what uh, Action for Healthy Kids volunteer Kathy Whaley did was decided to just basically bring all these groups together. And using uh, the game on model, kind of helped focus this wellness team in their efforts um, with their school wellness initiative. So Kathy started by holding informational meetings. And again, the main purpose of these were just to kind of gain interest and enthusiasm of the group. And then after that team was formed, they, they set up their game plan. And they were determined that their you know, schedule of challenges, and they used um, different Game On free resources. And again, uh, Game On is a free resource that's found on the Action for Healthy Kids website. But they use this to promote the different activities. And the project ended up being a great success. Between 20 to 35 kids engaged in a variety of after-school games and physical activities and received healthy snacks two or three times a week. And they found that the school separate wellness efforts came together under one cohesive program, which had a greater impact on the students than all the teachers trying to do the various things throughout the day or, and or school year. So Kathy said it was a complete environmental shift for the whole building when they did game on. They just needed guidance, and once they got that, they were off and running. Now they have a plan, and their school health advisory council members have school wellness policy goals and objectives. The students of Westdale Elementary had so much fun. They are not going to let the teachers drop the program. So as you can see, by just taking the efforts um, and forming that committee and forming the ideas and, and coming with, up with one cohesive plan, um, you're really going to see a lot of success out of your wellness initiatives. So as we've talked through a lot of this stuff, we just wanted to highlight a few resources. Um, it covers data and gathering data on childhood health and obesity issues, ways to build your wellness team, program information such as Game On. And again, we wanted to highlight them on this one slide, but we will send them to you after the webinar, after a few days. So we're just going to take a moment here to pause and to ask any questions. So I just wanted to remind you that if you do have a question, there's a little uh, box underneath in the chat area. And you can type a question in if you have any questions at this point that Heidi and I can answer. I'm going to start. It looks like there's a question here. Um, I have a wellness team at my school, but it has started to fall apart, and I can't get anyone to come to the meetings anymore. Any ideas on how I can reinvigorate my team? Heidi, do you have any uh, first tips for this person on how they can get their team re-energized? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I should first mention that that is a really common thing that I hear a lot in our work, especially here in Illinois. Um, it can be really tough to get a team going and to keep up that, that energy, especially throughout the course of the school year as priorities change and different things come up. So one thing that I have found that is really successful is if, in fact, that does happen to your team, is to kind of pause, stop, and, and maybe with whoever's left on the team or if it's you alone, 
come up with some sort of project or event or something really concrete that people can uh, grab onto and then hold onto as, as something that the team can really see results with. So for example, I um, recently worked at a school in Chicago, Illinois, and they experienced this, this similar thing as well where the wellness team members just fell off and they decided, you know what, we're going to do something that is just a one-time event but is a way to really give our wellness team some purpose. So what they did was they planned a family fitness night. And they had a wonderfully successful um, night and they were able to kind of bring back some wellness team members to help participate in planning that event and because that event was so successful that was what served as the impetus for continuing to meet and really see what they could do to make it better or do more um, at that particular school now they're hosting monthly family fitness nights this is a year later so i think something like that, that that's really tangible and that's project oriented or event oriented can really help jumpstart the team um, alternatively, sometimes it, it does help if that happens toward the end of the school year. Sometimes it, it helps to the following school year, at the beginning of the year, start fresh. And just as all those steps that um, Hannah talked through and what we'll continue talking through is, you know, get new folks onto the team and, and start with an assessment and really get their buy-in at the beginning on what the priority should be. That will help give them a fresh start and keep them motivated throughout the year. Hannah, do you have anything else to contribute? Um, not at this time. We do have another question, though. Um, this person is starting a student-led wellness committee at their high school, and it's only going to be, it looks like, yes, it's an all-student wellness committee. Sorry, I just wanted to double-check that. Um, so they want to know if we have any advice um, for this all-student wellness activity or committee. So I'll just chime in here and just say, I mean, you kind of want to follow the same steps um, that I outlined, um, you know, making sure that you guys all have a vision and that uh, you can all come together and, and come up with ideas or projects throughout the year. I think with, with kids, though, they, they're really creative, and I think really listening to them um, and making sure that if it is student-led that, that you or, or someone uh, that you have that represents the school on the committee understands that there are certain rules and regulations and that you're aware of those. Um, and taking those um, and their voice kind of back to those leaders that make the decision. So I would just say you don't want to get them kind of all riled up without knowing that there are parameters at the school if they do have an idea. Um, but most likely they're, they come up with creative stuff themselves and really may put a nice new spin on, on some wellness ideas at your school. Heidi, do you have anything to add in there? Yeah, I actually just have two things from, again, from our work in um, here in Illinois and throughout the country with some of our high school students in particular. But uh, two things. One is really creating space for talking to students about what is school wellness. You know, what, what does that actually look like? What is advocacy around, you know, if you think that items in the cafeteria, for example, should be changed or modified, you know, who are the right people to talk to in the school building? Kind of having that initial open conversation is a great way to build leadership within the group and make sure that students understand what their greater role is in the school in terms of school wellness. And then the second thing that I would add is I think doing a student survey can be a really useful way for students to understand the value of collecting information and, and uh, creating programming that supports those needs that students have voiced. So that's something that we've done where students will either create a survey or there's uh, lots of examples online and on our website where uh, it could be a quick three-minute survey that students can either complete during lunch or maybe in a homeroom, and then that information can be used to guide wellness initiatives. So another great way to get students involved um, kind of in a, on a greater scope than maybe just on one or two projects. Okay, we do have a couple of questions, but I'm going to leave those to the end since we are running a bit behind on our schedule. So Heidi, do you want to walk us through the next step? And if for some reason we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will follow up personally, we promise. Yeah, no problem. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the second part of today's webinar, assessing your school's wellness environment. So as you can see on the screen, I think that this quote really rings true. Um, as G George Bernard Shaw once said, the only man who behaves rationally is my tailor. He takes my measurements anew every time he sees me, while all the rest go on with their old measurements and expect me to fit them. So we, we present this quote in a way for, for you to really think about, you know, as you've formed your team, it's a, it's a really smart idea to conduct an assessment of your school's practices related to student health. 
year over year, these practices can change. So it's important to continually assess what's happening so that you can make sure that your initiatives are focused. So why would you do a wellness assessment? Although, trust me, I know it can be tempting just to jump right in and start a project. There are a number of good reasons to start with an assessment first. So as you can see on your screen here, it enables your team to do a number of things. First, it helps you develop relationships with key staff. So hopefully you've already been doing this, but the assessment provides another reason to communicate and work together with key staff throughout the building. So for example, touching base with a physical education teacher and asking uh, different questions about what's happening in physical education can help you learn about what that physical education environment looks like and develop that relationship with that educator. Second, it helps you, of course, determine your school's strengths and weaknesses. Third, it will help you to find goals that really suit your school's needs. And hopefully at some point, these goals will go into either a school wellness policy or even a school improvement plan. Next, it'll help you justify your decision to make changes. So I find that data-driven work is a really great way for school wellness teams to justify to the administration or to parents why they're doing what they're doing. And then finally, it'll help you document starting points in order to show progress over time. These can be really important down the road as it enables you to show that your efforts have achieved these measurable results and it will help to create sustainability for the long term. Also, data is always useful to have for funding requests, especially grants. That's another thing to keep in mind. So there's a number of types of wellness assessments. I'm going to go through each of these um, relatively quickly, but I encourage you to uh, do your own research to see which one meets your needs. Um, a few of the tools that we do recommend are, um, first, the School Health Index. This is the tool that we use at Action for Healthy Kids. It was developed by the CDC, and it's based on the eight components of coordinated school health that Hannah mentioned earlier. This is a really comprehensive tool. It not only helps you evaluate where your school stands, but it also guides you through a process of determining what your priorities should be and, and how you can develop specific goals for improving your school health environment. The second tool that's listed here is the WellSAT tool. This was developed by the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale. And this tool is used to measure the strength of district-level wellness policies. Um, but you could also use it to measure what is or perhaps what is not being practiced at your school. Uh, the third tool we recommend is the Fuel to Play 60 School Wellness Investigation, which is designed for schools that are using the Fuel to Play 60 approach. But it could also be used by any school to assess their wellness environment, uh, regardless of whether or not they're using Fuel Up to Play 60. It encourages students to be involved in completing the evaluation, so it might be a good fit if students are a part of your wellness team or make up the majority of your wellness team. And then finally, another option is the Healthy Schools Program Inventory that was developed by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Uh, in order to use their assessment, you have to sign up your school for their six-step Healthy Schools Program, and then your school's results are shared with the Alliance. So these are just four options for you, but we do recommend that you investigate each of these tools and decide which one might work best for your school. As I mentioned, the School Health Index is something we use at Action for Healthy Kids, so if you're not really sure where to get started, I might recommend that you start there. Um, but if you're doing your project as part of a grant, you may also be required to fill out an assessment or a pretest as part of your evaluation before starting that project. So what that looks like could depend on the granting organization. It might be one of these, or it might be something that's different or overlapping. So all of these assessments address nutrition in school meals, as well as physical education and physical activity. And they may also co cover a number of other topics that are listed on your slides, such as health education, wellness policy, um, perhaps even staff wellness. And you'll notice the last three areas that are start on your, uh, on your slides are covered in the school health index. So it takes it above and beyond what might be traditionally thought of as school wellness into some of the school health services. So after you choose your assessment, you'll want to decide how you're going to administer it. And this is really important because sometimes it can be a little overwhelming if it's just one person. So a couple of things to think about are, you know, one, will you do it as a group during a wellness team meeting? Or perhaps maybe assign subcommittees to complete different areas? Another question might be, do you want to involve students or not? Um, certainly you want to make sure that school staff are involved in the assessment if you're not part of a school but be careful not to place the entire burden on them. Um, in most cases, the oversight or management of the assessment should be done by the wellness team and not by the school staff. In my experience, I found that 
dividing up sections and having one person in charge of various sections can be a really effective way to get it done in, the, in an efficient and quick manner. And then after you complete the assessment, discuss the results as a team. What are your school strengths and weaknesses? Um, I definitely want to uh, reiterate this point simply because I think sometimes we can complete assessments and check it, off our, check it off our list and move on, but I really encourage you to take the time to discuss those results and, and analyze where you stand as a school. Uh, then make sure you celebrate the strengths. See if you can publicize them in the school newsletter or perhaps in the letter to parents or maybe you can even share them at a staff meeting or at a school event. Your school community will more readily accept your efforts to address these areas of weakness if they feel good about what they've already accomplished. This can also be a nice tool to gain more administrative support if you're struggling to get your principal or assistant principal on board. And then use those weaker areas along with the passions of the people on your team to guide the projects your team would like to tackle first. So in a moment we'll talk about developing that action plan which will help you prioritize some of those areas of weakness. And then keep in mind that your team should conduct a wellness assessment, ideally the same one, annually so you can measure your progress over time. So I'm going to take just a moment to highlight another success story from a school in Chicago, Illinois, Tulsa Chicali Elementary School. Um, I understand this process may seem overwhelming, especially if you've never completed an assessment before, which is part of the reason why I wanted to share this success story. So during the 12-13 school year, Tulpa Chikali Elementary School in Chicago, Illinois received a grant from Action for Healthy Kids that focused on implementing the Game On program, which has been referenced earlier, ultimately to help their school align with district wellness policies. So as part of this grant, the Tulpa Chikali Wellness Team completed an assessment of their school's wellness environment to get a better understanding of where their gaps were as they related to the district wellness policies. When they completed the assessment, they realized a number of different things, but one thing that really struck them was that classroom physical activity breaks were an integral part of the policies, but it was something their school had never done before, had never talked about. So needless to say, the team didn't waste any time in getting started. Uh, a couple of things that they did in order to kind of alleviate this area of weakness was uh, training their staff on the district wellness policies. So they did this uh, three times during the year. They set a schedule for it, and then they, in those trainings, they specifically highlighted the role of classroom physical activity, and they provided resources that the staff could use. They knew they wanted to take that support, though, that training to the next level. So what they did was they applied and received a district-level grant that provided funding to purchase materials that could be used to support classroom physical activity. And then finally, as a result of all of those great efforts around physical activity, their wellness team was then able to apply for the Healthier U.S. School Challenge Certification Program, which helped to recognize their school's efforts at creating a healthier environment. This is a lot that was done, and it was done all in a year, but um, I think the real key to the story is that the assessment what was, was what helped them realize where their gaps were and ultimately allowed them to apply for a certification program. So at the end of the school year, the Temple Chikali Wellness Team conducted the same assessment again and they discovered that they were in full alignment with the district wellness policies, which was a great success for the school, and the school has since been recognized publicly for their efforts, and they've decided to continue doing an assessment each year to ensure they meet all the policy requirements. So a great uh, example of a school that didn't have any experience in assessing their wellness environment and had a lot of success around doing so. Here are the links to some of those assessments that we discussed, and as we've mentioned several times, these links will be available in the follow-up materials. So we're going to take another moment to pause for questions, specifically about assessing your wellness environment. Hannah, do we have any questions that are ready? Um, we do have some questions, but they are not pertaining to your uh, the last few topics. Do you mind if I ask them anyway? Sure, yeah, let's take uh, one or two, and then we can... Okay. Um, so one of them actually did come in about the uh, Chicago school that you just talked about, and they wanted to know what assessment um, tool that they used. Yeah, great question. I'm sorry I didn't mention that earlier. They actually used the so Chicago Public Schools created a, it's essentially a checklist that helped them break down the policy and assess each area. So that was a little bit of a unique situation where their district provided that assessment. However, um, in, in your own district, I recommend 
either connecting with the district office, the principal might even know. And I've seen it's more and more common for districts to do assessments of schools that they may complete annually. So that might be an option for your school. Great. And then real quick, um, how do I ensure my wellness program is sustained if there are staff changes? Buy-in was with a previous principal. Have any tips for her? That's again, that's a really tough question. Um, what I have found is it, it helps to have, actually for the kids we recommend having at least five members on your wellness team. So um, sometimes it's hard to get that number and sometimes more than five can be a little bit difficult to manage. So my recommendation would be to try and avoid that staff turnover by getting five members who are solid, active participants of the team and really cultivate their activity in the wellness team. And then that way, even if you lose three or four of them, which is a pretty extreme case, chances are you'll still have a couple of members left over the next year that can be the ones that step up and start leading the team. So that's what I found year over year that um, that can really help. If it does have to do with the principal turnover, what I found is setting up a time to meet with the new principal at the beginning of the school year um, and, and just sitting down and, and giving them the lay of the land of the things that have been done in the previous year. If you have an assessment at that point with data to share, I find that data really helps principals especially. Or if you have a district wellness policy that's on the books that can be used as kind of the motivator behind that, showing the principal that, hey, there's this policy that we need to align with. These are all the great things we did last year. Uh, we're looking to continue this work forward. Um, so those would be my suggestions. Hannah, feel free to contribute if you have anything as well. No, that sounds good. I think I'll try to um, keep everybody moving forward. And again, if you ask a question and we don't answer it right away, we'll ensure to get it at the end. And if not, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Just to remind you that um, everything today is being re recorded and archived, so you will be able to assess the uh, slides um, after the webinar. So we're going to start um, discussing developing and implementing an action plan. Now that we've formed our committee and we've talked about um, goals and, and assessing our environment, let's talk about an action plan moving forward. So we like to include this little quote from Nathaniel Braden. A goal without an action plan is a daydream. This can also be um, a good, good personal uh, quote for you as well when you're developing uh, personal items, let alone um, setting up your school's wellness committee. So why develop an action plan? There's so many benefits to, to doing this, and taking the time to think through them obviously is going to make it more beneficial for your school. So it obviously is going to build the team camaraderie, and the process of developing an action plan together will kind of make everyone within your committee feel more invested. If you do um, some group brainstorming, each member of your team will bring a different skill set to the table. Um, so your plans will be more thought out when everyone is able to kind of voice their own opinion together. Providing um, an action plan will obviously provide clear communication so everyone is, is clear on what the project goals are, know what each one of them is expected to do and by when. It will also help delegate specific activities so that one person doesn't feel like they have to do it all themselves. And it should help eliminate confusion and uh, potential conflicts. And then the timeline, it's powerful to have something written down on paper so they know that we will accomplish a specific task by a specific date. And this will help create that sense of urgency and keep everyone going so that the project doesn't stall. So what are the steps in the action planning and implementation process? By this time, you've already completed the first two steps on the screen. You've formed a wellness committee, and you've assessed your school environment. Now all the steps we're going to go over is actually um, on our action planning template, which you'll find within the parent toolkit page at Action for Healthy Kids. We'll highlight that in um, upcoming slides. But we'll show you that template before we finish today, too, and we'll give you that link after the webinar. Once you've formed your team and completed your assessment, it's time to select a project. Using the assessment result, results excuse me, and the passions of the people on your team as a guide uh, will be important moving forward in picking and choosing that project. And if you haven't already chosen a project, make sure you obtain um, the project approval from your school administrator, as we mentioned before. And then that will help determine 
um, your project goals. So laying out your project goals is very important. Um, you want to think about the why, why you're doing this project. Why is it important? Uh, why is there a need for this project? What's missing or lacking in your school that the project will help you fulfill? Who is your target audience? Is it students, teachers, families, maybe everyone, all of the above? Then you want to think about what behaviors you're hoping to change and what specific impacts do you want to have from this project. So to help you, um, we have laid out um, what is called SMART goals. And this will just help you with your desired outcomes. You'll be able to measure them and track them more efficiently. And SMART is an acronym. And you'll see that each one stands for something. Um, the S in SMART stands for specific. So we want to be specific when we're writing our project goals rather than general. The specific goals tells the team exactly what's expected, why it's important, who's involved, and where it's going to happen. The M stands for measurable. It answers questions like how much, how many, and how will I know when it is accomplished. SMART goals are realistic and attainable. That's what the A stands for. To be considered meaningful, they can reach out to, to reach, or they can be considered to represent performance that is below standard. And choose, goal, choose goals that matter. They are relevant to your school, your community, your students, and your students' performance. And SMART goals are also time-bound. They have a target date, a commitment to a deadline that helps your wellness team focus their efforts and prevents goals from being overtaken by the day-to-day -day crises. And they answer questions like when, what specific changes will have occurred at the end of the current school year. So we've put together for you um, a few SMART goals and measurable impacts for two types of school projects. This first one we're looking at is for a garden project. So we obviously see by the first bullet that this project goal that at the end, excuse me, by the end of the school year, 125 students in grades two and three will participate in a school garden with learning activities in their classroom. They also, as a goal, have stated that 200 students will have tasted produce from the school garden by November 15th. That's very specific. And also, that weekly consumption of fruits and vegetables in the cafeteria will increase by 15% at the end of the school year. So note that all of these three goals are very specific. You obviously can put any outcome measures around them. They're relevant, and they're also time bound. So the team needs to really feel that their goals are, are attainable. And using the SMART method will definitely help you. This next example that we look at is one for um, physical activity project, and um, some of them are, uh, this is specifically for uh, classroom activity brain breaks. Uh, at 150 students, we'll have 15 more minutes of physical activity each day throughout their classroom breaks by March 15th. Again, very, very specific. And by the end of the school year, 100% of classroom teachers will be implement activity breaks in their classroom. So again, we look at the timing. They're attainable, measurable, and specific. If you are collecting data around these impacts, uh, you do want to note that to help your school with strategic planning, um, it's good to have these um, outcomes in a, a way that you can present what worked and what didn't. We also want to know maybe what behaviors have changed as a result of your project. And also to help your uh, school promote those successes and lead to program sustainability, these outcomes will be very, very helpful for your school. So the next action step after you put your goals together is to form an implementation plan. You want to develop a timeline and assign tasks. So you want to write out your action plans, or action steps, excuse me, um, who the team member is that's responsible, the start and the end date, um, and the status and or a to-do list for each task. You want to include things like evaluation, project promotion, and communication. These are all very important action steps. You will also need to develop a budget. You want to write down um, the potential cost for your projects. They may include equipment, supplies, incentives, gifts, awards, promotion, uh, printing or copying, any uh, meeting costs that you may have. You may want to um, determine if any items can be donated or borrowed. And then add up your total project. And you obviously want to discuss where all of these things will come. 
come from. Um, as we look um, at the budget, we want to talk about funding. And in an ideal world, there would also uh, have, you know, each school and each district would be able to fund full projects, but we know that that isn't a reality. Um, so that you really need to spend some time looking for funding. And um, if there are any, is there any money around that could, would go unused? And to just kind of ask questions about um, that potential money. So find out if your PTO or PTA has any earmarks for wellness projects. Um, look outside the school. You may have families that might be willing to donate. Um, or, you know, if they're passionate about health, may want to put their name up at the, on the new playground that, since they donated money. Sometimes you're able to find great community partners who are willing to donate uh, goods or services, um, grocery stores, parks and rec departments, some sporting goods, local uh, spas or fitness groups, garden centers or hardware stores. I know often we'll, we'll give discounts to um, school-related equipment. Also, there are many grants out there uh, from many different organizations, both at the local level and national um, level. So it's good to, to look at funding opportunities as well. Uh, Live Well Colorado has a funding opportunity webpage that's listed there as well that you can check out if you're in that state. So after we've, we've talked uh, through the implementation plan and, and the budget, we want to look at actually putting all of this work into action. So tracking your progress against your project goals is going to be key. Reflecting upon all the successes and challenges along the way and making sure that you record them within your action plan will be ideal in order to help you kind of build uh, the next year's action plan as well. You want to be able to um, communicate these successes throughout the course of the project to reinforce the key messages, um, recognize achievement, thank participants, and build the future support. And again, will help you kind of build and shape your following year's uh, action plan. So let's talk about a little bit of a few ways we can do this. Um, you want to provide the PTO or PTA with committee updates. Um, you want to be you know, public about it and thank those who have made your projects a success. Um, if you do have any ways to kind of broadcast these announcements through a daily school announcement, newsletters, handouts, maybe you have a, a, Facebook, a school Facebook page, um, or a school-wide assembly, anything to kind of celebrate and recognize these key team members who made it possible. Also through other district channels as well. If you can and you have local media, that would, um, you know, get some attention from them. Try to do that there and to send them, you know, the newspaper or the local TV channel about your special event. Um, you could also start a social media campaign. Get your parents um, who are into social media and have them maybe help uh, start talking up the project and help give you ideas on how they can, can do all this. And something that we don't have on the slide, but I, I would just encourage you again throughout your process to document everything through whether it's writing it down and keeping track at your meetings and or taking photos along the way. Photos can really go a long way. So I'd really encourage you to, um, you know, take pictures during your events um, in order to help celebrate that success. So the last step in um, your action steps is to create sustainability. Um, uh, someone from a school wellness team member, member in Texas uh, said a project has more chance for sustainability if, the results in a lifestyle, if it results in a lifestyle change supported by the school environment and family. So we know it's a good definition of sustainability when it comes uh, to health and wellness projects, and we're trying to create this lasting lifestyle change, not just a one-time project that may have short-term value. Uh, we're looking for things that have the lasting impact. So it's important when we consider all of the volunteer time that you're putting in, and we're trying to fund for all our projects. Funders um, are not really interested in investing in those short-term impacts or projects. And as parents, you should be um, considering your own investment of time and resources in the same way. So we have five health and wellness experts from our team um, in Colorado and Texas to talk about sustainability with us um, as a key part of the action planning. And um, it is listed as a final step in our process because it continues on after a project is wrapped up. However, uh, plans for sustainability are very important to incorporate throughout the course of the project and the planning process. So I believe that Heidi, I'm going to turn it back over to her, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what they talked about, those uh, key school team members. Great. 
Thank you, Hannah. I know we have just about 10 minutes left, so um, we'll, we'll finish with talking a little bit more about sustainability and then um, have some time for some questions at the end. Um, but the first thing that they had mentioned was that community engagement was the number one key to sustainability mentioned by those wellness experts. So that means involving the school staff, involving parents, students, as well as just your general community members, not only in the project itself, the event, or whatever it is that you're planning, but also in the, all of the stages, the planning, the implementation. That's really critically important to getting their buy-in and ensuring that it's a lasting and, and also a positive impact. So making community engagement a part of your action plan from the beginning, as well as an ongoing basis, is critical for success. This uh, further highlights the importance of having a team as opposed to just one individual implementing your project. Specific support, for, support from the principal was also mentioned by many of the experts. And I know we've talked about this a little bit before, but just wanted to reiterate that this was a key piece to sustainability is involving the principal at the highest possible level of commitment. So at the very minimum, he or she must support the project, even if they're not actively participating on the team or in the development of the project. Having a vision was also a key element. So as Hannah mentioned earlier on, using your first wellness team meeting is a great way to start your chances of having a sustainable program from the very beginning. So define your vision and use it as a way to market the project. That will help you get that community buy-in and engagement that we talked about just a couple of slides ago. And according to our experts, a project has more chance for sustainability if it's presented as an ongoing program or initiative to improve student academic achievement and school success, and if it doesn't need to rely on continuous grant funding. So a quick example here, um, sometimes I think it's difficult if the wellness team presents a project that's uh, very siloed, something like a school garden, for example, which is a, a wonderful um, project to work on. But in presenting it to the school, it should be presented as a school garden that's part of the greater school wellness initiatives and the school's greater efforts to become a healthy school. By presenting it in that way, you have a higher chance of having a sustainable program because it's understood that this is part of what the school is becoming as opposed to a one-time project. So according to one of our experts, Leslie, whether it becomes part of staff development, such as physical activity in the classroom, evaluation criteria for staff performance reviews, or an annual class activity. Allocating curriculum-oriented funding increases the chance for sustainability, as it's no longer regarded as a special health and wellness project. So that's just one example of how a school could support the funding of these kinds of ongoing initiatives. Um, I've also had a lot of success with schools that have started to do healthy fundraising, such as walkathons. Um, or selling non-food items as a way to fund their school wellness initiatives. Um, that, in turn, those fundraisers become a school tradition that can be happening annually. So make sure your initiative is, on, is ongoing and take steps to ensure that progress is being linked and incorporated into school policies, future practices, programs, and then the school's traditions. Um, for example, you could work to get it written into the district or school level wellness policy in school guidelines or in the school improvement plan. Most schools do have a school improvement plan around academic performance and other goals, and these are usually mandated by the state, and they serve as a guide for principals. Uh, so the school improvement plan can be one of the best places to put school wellness goals as progress is reviewed on a regular basis. And your school's accountability committee or school improvement team is a great place to start. And if you're not sure about what, who this team is, um, definitely get in touch with your school's principal so that you can learn a little bit more how you could start to integrate health and wellness into these plans. And these ongoing initiatives also rely on student buy-in and help to engage students. So we recommend as Action for Healthy Kids that you use a tested program to frame your wellness efforts um, as a way to get students involved, as a way to get them excited, and as a way to get them wanting more. Uh, so as opposed, again, to doing like a one-time project or one-time event, uh, doing using a framework such as Game On, which you see on your screen here, is a great way to kind of wrap it all together and make it a cohesive initiative. So Action for All the Kids' is Game On program is just uh, one program that you could use. It's free, it's online, and it's essentially it's a way to tailor your school wellness initiative to your school's own particular needs. It's a program that helps schools practice good nutrition and physical activity habits 
with more than 50 fun and easy to implement challenge ideas. So we'll share this link that you see on your screen in the follow-up materials. Uh, but this is something that uh, schools here in Illinois and across the country have used to implement district wellness policies. So if you're trying to figure out how you can align with your district wellness policies, using a program like Game On is a great way to give you some, uh, some framework in order to do so. And then finally, I want to mention that you can also sign up for a recognition program like the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, which we briefly mentioned earlier. These awards and recognition can help cement your school's wellness identity, if you will, and they can be used as a marketing tool for your school to create positive publicity. So any positive recognition that your school receives is likely to leave your school community wanting more. So it's a great way to kind of ensure sustainability and, and make sure people are supporting the program. Uh, they also put your initiatives in a favorable light. So again, it's this positive recognition that can be really supportive. Some of these programs may even offer a financial incentive if awarded, so that can help make uh, that can help fund health and wellness programs in future years. So for example, with the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, it ranges from five hundred to two thousand dollars, depending on the level that you're the level that you're awarded. In addition to the Healthier U.S. School Challenge, you also see there are um, other pro recognition programs. The Alliance for a Healthier Generation has the Healthy Schools Recognition Program, and then some states may also implement state level awards. So, for example, Colorado does have the Healthy School Champion Scorecard, which is a state level recognition award, and Indiana has the Healthy Hoosier School Award. I want to take just uh, another minute to talk about the Healthier U.S. School Challenge because the application has changed this year. So even if your school is already certified, this might be another opportunity to seek recertification. So this new application focuses on smarter lunchrooms. Um, so the Healthier U.S. School Challenge Smarter Lunchrooms Initiative is a voluntary initiative that was established back in 2004, about 10 years ago, to recognize schools that participate in the National School Lunch and School Breakfast programs that have taken it above and beyond to create healthier school environments. Um, as I mentioned, the application has been recently updated, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, it, and this new application emphasizes developing lifetime healthy habits, and those schools that receive the award are really demonstrating a, a commitment to school health and wellness to the greater community. The certification lasts for four years. The schools that are receiving the award commit to meet the criteria throughout that four-year certification program, and the criteria is consistent with the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program. So if your school is meeting those requirements, uh, you're, uh, you should cer certainly look into the Healthier U.S. School Challenge to see how you can continue to improve your efforts. So I'm going to uh, skip over this last success story, but we will uh, include it in the recording so you can read some of the slides and get a little bit more information there. Um, but, but for the sake of time, I do want to um, move on. So just really quickly on your screen here, um, we had mentioned the templates that we have available at Action for Healthy Kids. We'll send these links in a follow-up, but these two templates here, a budget template and an action plan template, are meant to be uh, resources for you. So as you are creating a budget, go ahead and use our budget template, get a sense of what kinds of things you might want to include. And then with the action plan, we have a, a multi-year action plan that we recommend using to kind of pick the, the key pieces of school wellness programs and make a plan around each of those over the course of several years to make it a little bit more manageable. And with that, I know we have a, a couple of minutes for questions. Hannah, do we have any um, last-minute questions we want to address before we wrap up? Um, we do, just one. There was someone who was um, talking about the new um, regulations on district wellness policies and how um, there are certain requirements around those. Um, that includes administrative review. Can you provide um, any feedback to her on how to encourage um, her administration on how to get started with this? Yeah, so um, I think I do. So I'll, I'll take a, a shot at it. And if not, um, I know we have our policy expert on staff here at Action for Healthy Kids, and I'll certainly have her follow up just for some more clarification. But um, one, one thing that I have found is that you know, if, if the administration should be reviewing these wellness policies, but sometimes it's, it's just the time to train them on what the wellness policy encompasses. So my recommendation would be to set up a time to meet with the administration to talk through the wellness policy 
requirements, um, and then using that, provide them with some more information about how they can set up additional meetings so that they can sit and review each individual area to, to make sure that they agree that it, it's where it should be and then that they have a plan for implementation. Um, I think I'm, I may have touched on that question, but as I mentioned, we, um, I will make note of that question and we'll have our wellness policy expert follow up with some more information. I might just add, um, too, that helping your administrators stay on task is going to be key. So maybe, you know, uh, something you could build into your action plan for your wellness committee is to start by, you know, organizing the administrators to get them to review the wellness, the wellness policies um, with the wellness committee. So maybe even, you know, every month kind of looking at one section or working through it so they understand. Um, you know, on an annual basis how it's reviewed. So I think if you can kind of help set up um, some sort of uh, timeline for them, that would help them in understanding when it needs to happen um, moving forward. So you have a kind of an annual review, if you will, timeline. And it looks like that is all of the questions we have today. Yep, that's all we have. Okay. Well, great. Um, thank you for your participation. So that concludes our webinar today. And as we've mentioned, we'll send a follow-up email within a couple of business days. That will also include a registration link for the next webinar in the series if you're interested in continuing uh, to learn about how you can make your school a healthier place. A final note, um, if you do want to learn more about Action for Healthy Kids and how you can get involved with our mission and our movement, I encourage all of you to just take 10 seconds to take the Every Kid Healthy Pledge to help us create a 100,000-person movement to make all schools healthier places. It just takes 10 seconds, as I mentioned, um, and it's a really easy way for you to say, yes, I'm committed to this. I'm pledging to uh, continue to make changes in my own school. And then once you've signed on, we'll show you ways, both big ways and small ways, that you can turn your uh, commitment into action. So thanks, everyone, for your time today, and have a great remainder of the afternoon.